Greetings, friends. This is Connor from Rose Red Flechette, and this is a new series I'm starting on my, uh, well, this channel's mostly for Let's Plays, which is my other main sort of way that I spend my time, uh, my free time anyway. Um, I recently made a post on Facebook, uh, on social media, I guess, uh, you know, basically stating that uh, I had some interest in making a YouTube series about Reason and some of my production techniques and also some of my um, some of my creative process, I think. Um, just to kind of, uh, this, this video is going to be kind of an intro. I'm not really going to show you how to do anything. This is just kind of like an intro to the series, a prelude, if you will. Right now in the background, you guys are enjoying and uh, watching uh, a small piece of um, the upcoming album, actually, uh, uh, on low in the background. Um, over here, this tiny little square, this tiny little blue outline, that's the part of the rack that you're actually seeing. And this is all of the rest of it. And this is only a small fraction of the greater whole that I kind of cut out for the purposes of this video, just because I didn't want it to be just my voice. But uh, that's what's relatively quietly uh, playing in the background. Um, anyway, so I'm going to come right out and say that uh, part of the reason I'm doing this is to hopefully give people a better understanding of... Uh, a better understanding of my music because um, when you do kind of hybrid experimental stuff uh, you you do have to um, you know uh, I mean I don't know if it's like this for everybody uh, or not, not everybody but I don't know if it's like this for, for other people that you know kind of push boundaries or, and, and push back against uh, you know the, the formulas that, that people use when they compose music but uh, it's it's not glamorous. It's uh, uh, you really. There's a lot of there's a lot of loneliness that goes into it, and because you really don't fit in anywhere. And uh, you know, it might sound it might sound all badass to 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 make something unique and interesting and crazy and you know awesome. You know, there are people, I'm sure, in the scope of the audience of this video, that think it's awesome, and I think that's. I think that's amazing. That's I'm so grateful for that. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and there's there's a lot of ways that I feel about what I do um, that other people don't necessarily. One of the biggest things I think is that a lot of people don't think my music is danceable. I totally think it is. <laughs> and that's part of what I'm going to cover in this series is, is, is part of my thought process in that. Um, but I'm going to be going over a lot of technical stuff as well. Um, but uh, mainly my purpose for this is partially to educate and it's partially a selfish thing to try and get people to kind of see where I'm coming from and also explain um, sort of the mindset that goes into... Um, composing something that's that's different like composing something without a recipe without a formula that you follow um, sitting down and just making the music that you want to hear and not making music because not sitting down and being like oh I'm gonna write an industrial track or I'm gonna write a side trance track or hey let's go make some fucking house music like you know it's how to avoid that uh, is hopefully going to be something that I want to cover. But I also do want to cover some... I want to take some of the mystery away. And if you want to hold on to the mystery, that's cool. Like, you know, you don't have to watch. <laughs> or you can skip past those videos or whatever. But um, it is kind of intermediate level. Um, I'm not going to be, like, showing people a lot of beginner level stuff. Um, these videos are going to kind of assume that you know certain things. Um, now, they're all going to be in Reason, um, because Reason's what I use. And there's a lot in Reason that I don't think really translates to other DAWs. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll try and... 
I'll, I'll try and give some leeway and, and maybe go in a little more depth when those things come around. Um, but this assumes that you already know all the basics, like you, you know what LFOs are, automation, um, you know, samples, all that stuff, um, different kinds of synthesis, additive, subtractive, uh, granular, uh, that you know what an arpeggiator is, which is what these uh, three spastic looking things here, these are, these are called Euclid rhythm generators and I use these a great deal. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'll point out uh, instruments, effects, and utilities that I use frequently because a lot of them don't come with reason and a lot of them are actually third party modules that Propellerheads, the company that makes reason, has opened reason up to. Uh, they've opened the rack up to third-party support and lately VSTs, but by the time they opened it up to VSTs, I had already dropped so much money on rack modules that I didn't really, I didn't really, there weren't any VSTs that I really felt that I needed. Um, but I will be pointing out some of the stuff that I use frequently, and that way, if it's third-party, um, you know, I don't know, maybe they make, uh, maybe they make VST versions that you can use in like Ableton or whatever. Um, but yeah, so it's going to kind of, like, it's going to kind of assume that you already know some stuff. <laughs> um, so it's not like a beginner's level thing and it's, it's not even really, it's to show you how to do stuff with, a, you know, with, uh, with a, with an instrument that you're already familiar with, uh, that, that is to say a DAW. Um, and um, so yeah, we'll cover a few devices that I commonly use. Um, I'll do a basic overview of some techniques and uh, that's gonna include um, basically some of the things that I do that are a little more, a little more unique. Um, there's a lot of um, instrument on instrument gating uh, and a lot of basically use, using one instrument to gate another uh, that I use very frequently in my music. Uh, there are some very common techniques that other producers and really most producers use that I don't as much and that's mostly because I've uh, this is a this is a program that I've been using since I was 18 and I'm like 30 now so <laughs> I kind of know it like I mean I don't want to say that I'm like an expert but uh, because there are still things that I learn about it uh, almost every time I open it up really uh, it's a very deep program but I am very confident in my ability with this program like there's there's very little that I feel like if there's something that I want, if there's something that I can hear in my head, like I'm confident that I can approximate it in here. And uh, I owe a lot of that to Reason's design and Reason's sort of, uh, Reason's layout and the way that, uh, that Reason lets you do, particularly uh, this stuff. All this nonsense that you see right here. None of this was done automatically. Well, I mean, some of it does. Like basic in and output stuff is generated automatically when you make new stuff. Like all these little, these skinnier cables, these yellow ones, those are what's called uh, CV, control voltage cables. And basically all of that is sending um, gate and or note data uh, to and from different modules to modulate different pieces of the track and different parameters of the instruments and that is something that I don't think any other DAW gives you as much flexibility with and you can do some really interesting creative stuff which I will get into um, but there are some techniques that a lot of you know I, I very rarely like there's some there's some sort of idiosyncrasies that I have with my production method I, I don't I avoid using compression wherever possible mostly because <laughs> mostly because I don't really know how to use it that well that's just that's a flaw that I have I don't I've never put a compressor on something and had it come out sounding better than it did before <laughs> you know 
Uh, and I know, I know every part of a compressor and what they all do. I know how a compressor works. Uh, but I don't know. I just don't like compression. Like, if there's any compression that lead needs to be done, uh, you know, I usually leave that to to the to uh, my mastering engineer or you know any other. And usually I can tell if something's going to need something, but what I usually use to achieve the same ends is extremely uh, thorough use of EQ and stereo space. Um, you know, there's there's uh, the basic the basic law of EQ and mixing is basically that you don't want too many things occupying a certain range of frequencies. You want to give everything kind of its own space. And over time, I've learned frequencies that I like for certain things and frequencies that I don't. And that's just become my system. And I rarely deviate from it unless something calls for it. And I will usually try and make everything else work around the EQ that I like. And uh, similarly, I'll use stereo image to sort of space things out, and that also gives you more room to work with to give you more amplitude. Um, yeah, those are kind of my leveling and EQ and compression habits. I usually do all of that stuff as I go. Frequently, while I'm actually composing something, I'll have meters in the red all over the place. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people that immediately sees something in the red as I'm composing it and feels the need to bring it down immediately. Uh, you know, I, I can get to that later. Um, I'm more worried about, especially because of my love of distortion, uh, coming from a noise and industrial background and a metal background, like, I don't know, distortion doesn't bother me so much to where I need to get rid of it immediately. Sometimes if something's redlining and clipping, it's making a sound that I like, and once I bring it down, it actually takes that away, and then I'm like, okay, so I need to put some clipping distortion on there, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, as many of you know that are probably watching this, uh, metal, industrial, and noise are probably some of my biggest influences. I know that the Psytrance scene has kind of been the biggest, or not Psytrance, I'll say psychedelic, uh, electronic music scene has kind of been one of my biggest supporters, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, but the fact is, I don't listen to a lot of Psytrance anymore. Um, and uh, I thought to say I don't like it, because uh, I do. It's just one of those things that I rarely feel the need to, uh, to hear outside of the context of it being played or DJed live. Um, it doesn't do much to inspire me out of that context anymore. Um, and that's mostly because, I mean, to be honest, I, I just... I don't hear a lot of, I mean, I kind of heard a lot of artists doing really interesting things and then I kind of took what I could from those and then kind of moved on. And, um, but uh, all the same, the psychedelic scene really kind of has been my number one fan, even though I really don't even 100% fit in there and there's still a lot of kind of resistance to what I do. But I wanted to go ahead and kind of throw that out there. Um, and, uh, you know, video game music is another big one that I'm sure people can probably hear. And, uh, and then uh, as far as reason goes, um, like I said, been using it for over a decade now. Um, I've amassed a great deal of rack extensions and uh, modules for the program. And it is all that I use. I don't use anything else. Um, the only other thing you might see me use, let me see if OBS will pick it up. OBS is what I'm using to broadcast, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah, here's OBS. Uh, this is the only other application that I ever use, and it's actually Mac exclusive. So, um, you know, if you can, uh, if you can use like Parallels or VMware to, to uh, uh, or Dual Boot perhaps, uh, maybe a jailbroken Mac OS, you might be able to get this uh, if you're running Windows, but otherwise it's Mac exclusive. And basically what I use this uh, program for is mostly processing. 
There's a few other artists that have used it. Probably the most famous one is Apex Swim. Uh, if you listen to like the Come to Daddy or Window Licker EPs, uh, he actually made uh, some very characteristic uses of this program. And uh, But I won't be using it in this series. I just, for, for completion's sake, this is the only other thing that I ever occasionally use. And mostly it's a matter of bouncing something that I've made in Reason to an audio file importing it into medicine to make use of some of its more interesting effects that are uh, honestly kind of unique in their own way as well. And then bouncing it right back out of medicine with those effects and then bringing it back into reason. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, and then as far as my music goes, uh, you know, I really do hope that uh, with this series we get, you know, maybe some people get like a better understanding of what it's about and, you know, uh, come to understand it maybe a little bit better. Um, and because for me, what it really is, is it's a matter of basically, I don't, I, you know, I consider my music very derivative and that's mostly because it is a patchwork of pieces of things that I like from various genres. There's a lot of things in here that sound familiar, but the way that they're arranged is what makes it different. And that's kind of that kind of deconstructionist and reassemblist. <laughs> uh, that's not really a word, but you get what I mean. Uh, kind of ethos that I have where I hear something that I like and then I take it out of its original context and put it somewhere else. And that's really kind of the crux of, you know, in my opinion, making unique music these days where like almost everything you can conceivably think of uh, you know has been done or tried in some capacity I mean everything from you know harsh noise and power electronics to ambient to IDM break core side trance side core you know gabber industrial hardcore crossbreed uh, power noise drum and bass dark step tech step you know just all that stuff of all different kinds of everything. It's just like, it's really, my music is very sound oriented. It's very, it, it, it rides on the back of the sounds that make it up. For example, like my kicks and my bass are obviously taken directly from Psytrance, particularly Neurotrance, as they call it back in the South where I'm from. And uh, and Psychor, and, you know, but I took those sounds because I like them, but I don't use them to make trance. It's this kind of attitude that, you know, if you're looking to make something a little experimental, which is really kind of what I'm pushing at, you know, you want to take things that you like out of their original context. And then take those pieces and use them to build something else it's like if you've ever had a lego set and like you know you get the box and it's like you build what's on the box but then in the instruction booklet if i remember correctly from when i was a little kid you had like all these other things that you could build with the same set but there were just pictures of them it didn't show you like the instructions to make them or anything it's kind of like that um but there are also a lot of techniques that I use to achieve that ends. And um, my music is very rhythm oriented and I will be doing a lot of videos about rhythm and about uh, beat structures and uh, measure structures. And basically um, the nature of that is kind of what requires my songs to be as long as they are. And as far as, you know, to a psychedelic audience, what makes my music psychedelic to me are the patterns and the rhythm. And to try and make people, to try and see if people will hear that, to try and see if people can pick out the pattern, hear it. And uh, everything in my music is based on a 4 4 chord, no matter how chaotic it sounds. And it's all based on basic 16th, 8th, or quarter note increments and it all revolves around that axis, no matter what. So there's always there's always a key to unlock whatever it is you're hearing. You just kind of got to find it with your ears. Uh, there's a lot of math that goes into 
to making my music and I don't think that it like you know it doesn't take a genius to do because you've got a sequencer no matter what DAW you're using and you've got your notes broken up in increments and all the math is already done for you it's just a matter of where you put it you know and then um, and then of course there I make a lot of liberal use of LFOs and a lot of liberal use of textures because I love distortion I love noise I love you know like power noise and all those like more distorted industrial genres they gave me a real love of texture and so I like things that are you know gritty sounding and I don't you know not quite as smooth you know stuff that has you know you know sound that something that sounds like you could skin your skin your knee on it <laughs> I don't know um, and as far as gear I mean you're watching this on my like MacBook Pro that's like I don't know five six years old now um, it's got an i7 eight gigs of RAM and uh, you know one terabyte SSD and it still chokes with some of the stuff I do easily easily in fact just before I fired up this video I actually had to delete out a whole bunch of unused modules from this segment of a larger track that I'm playing <laughs> um, and as far as gear I've got a uh, UC33 uh, M audio controller which I only use for live performances which by the way are not easy to do with what I do <laughs> And then I've got a chaos pad. I'm not a gear junkie. Most of what I do is inside the box. Uh, it's not. It's not fancy. I don't have anything to take pictures of and post on Facebook. You know, <laughs> like check out my sweet studio space. You know, there's not much to it. Um, but uh, you know, I really believe if you throw yourself into a program and you know make it more about your ideas. Um, than whatever gear you have like I couldn't tell you like you know if if I were to close out of this window right now I couldn't tell you what half these modules are named and who makes them I might be able to get one or the other with some of them but like as far as their their manufacturer and the name of them like I forget like you know I just I memorize these by like what they look like and what they do you know and what they do for me it's um, and yeah, live performance is not easy with this stuff. Uh, so that's something that I'm still working out. So if you were hoping for any videos on that, sorry. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, as far as making complex music, um, it's really about making, figuring out where you want the complexity to be and then trying to make the rest of your track kind of revolve around that. You know, you start out with the most complex part, and then, it which with me is usually rhythm, and then you make the other parts, the other tracks, the other instruments in your song play along with that and revolve around it. And in my case, you know, I've always got that, I've always got that, you know, very frequently I've got that constant snare in my tracks. Um, the percussion that is not, you know, kick oriented is usually pretty pretty consistent um, and that's because you know you always want to have kind of have a counterbalance unless you're making like IDM or break core or some shit not that those genres aren't awesome but a lot of them are so chaotic that you can't um, you know the pattern uh, you know you can pick it out you know maybe for short burst but it's gone as soon as you figured it out and into something else it's very spastic very um, you know it's not a slow burn whatsoever and um, while I still work at high BPMs, as you can see, this is 173 that we've got going right here. But it doesn't sound like that. Uh, there's a lot of sequencing tricks that are actually easier to do at high BPMs. But, you know, I usually, I usually play in halftime just because I like groove and I like uh, syncopation. And the faster the BPM gets, uh, the harder it is to do that unless you space the beats out. Um, it's not easy to do syncopation at higher BPMs uh, unless you're doing like break core or IDM or some some such, you know. Uh, and uh, to me, that just didn't have the right kind of impact, so I never really got into that. Even though it's definitely awesome music and it does inspire me, and I've actually been called break core by a few people. Um, but I think it's safe to say that that's not me. Um, 
but really I just I try and give people things to latch on to uh, while the craziness is happening but then I try and have that craziness happening in multiple areas in the same way so it actually you get a full painted picture and there's not just this one instrument off by itself doing something weird you know uh, you kind of make everything sync up and uh, and then as far as making uh, my music danceable you, you know uh, a lot of it like I said everything's based on a 4-4 core it's more about how I structure things around that and I'm gonna come right out and say just for the sake of honesty the metal band uh, Meshuggah is a very huge influence <laughs> for me um, mostly because of their use of rhythm and uh, I have some advantages over them in that I'm using a DAW with a sequencer and I have a visual fix on what I'm doing and it's just me doing it. It's not one person beholden to five other people or four other people. You know, it's not a band. And they're not, and I'm not like playing, physically playing an instrument, um, you know, that requires muscle memory or composing parts and having to get, you know, four other people to sync up with them. That's That's a whole... That's a whole nother level of fucking calculus what the fuck that I don't even, I don't even know. <laughs> but um, uh, their use of rhythm really inspired me and I've actually expanded on it in a few areas, um, I think, just by doing um, some things a little bit differently. And then, you know, of course, and then all the sounds that I use are for the most part inspired by um, by Psychor, Neurotrance, uh, Dark Step, and sort of that crossbreed drum and bass hardcore uh, sort of style um, that's getting pretty big right now. And then, of course, um, industrial power noise, noise music, power electronics, that kind of thing. So, those are probably my biggest like sonic influences in terms of the sounds that you hear in my music and where they've been picked out from. That kind of thing. And then, um, you know, BPMs. Like, when I started making music, I was in, like, the 130, 140, 150. Maybe I'd get crazy and go up to 160 sometimes. And then I just started falling more and more in love with faster and faster BPMs. And then as I started edging myself up, I found that in order to effectively compose the music that I wanted to hear, I actually had to do a lot of halftime stuff. And so I actually found... You know, I started making some really fast tracks, getting up towards 200 BPM and then, and then beyond. And then I was like, wow, there's like this whole other spectrum of, you know, song structure up in this area based on taking these really high BPMs, but playing to their halftime. Um, and so that's kind of what I've grown to do right now. I'm living basically in the drum and bass range between 170 and 180. And then from there, all the way up to 230, 240, uh, basically. So that's mostly the range that I live in these days. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is going to wrap up uh, my intro video. Um, didn't want to ramble on too much. Just kind of wanted to give you guys a basic forecast of what I'm going to be covering. Um, going to go into... Uh, first couple of videos probably gonna be about mostly about rhythm um, structuring of some of the beats that I use and some of the sequencing uh, tricks that I use for that. they're not really tricks they're more just like just things that I do that uh, I don't think most people think of but they're really simple uh, it's not um, you know not super complicated um, a few different rhythmic tricks uh, polyrhythms hypermeter which is basically where you take um, you know, where the, the meter and the measures basically of your track take are, are much longer than people are used to, take a long time to resolve and, you know, take, you know, 20, 30 seconds before you hear a repeat of the same thing, um, you know, in the extreme and, um, go into some arpeggiation tricks, like what you see happening right here, um, granular synthesis from familiar sounds you know taking uh, short sounds and basically stringing them together to make a long you know whatever it is that you want bass line soundscape ambience 
um, you know, stretching and reverb, which is how I do a lot of some of my more ambient sounds. Um, LFO modulation and basically crafting things with LFOs. Um, kick and bass gating, which you can do uh, a lot of uh, neat rhythmic tricks with. And then um, there'll be some other stuff thrown in there uh, as far as mixing genres and things like that. That's what I've got so far. I'm sure I'll probably come up with some more ideas, but that's going to wrap it up for the intro. I uh, see this is half an hour. I think I can probably get through uh, most, of these, most of these videos in half an hour, but yeah. Um, I guess for an intro video, it's kind of long, but uh, I guess you could consider it kind of like a, like a forward or introduction to uh, a book. <laughs> All right, guys, um, stay tuned. Um, I'll be releasing this video in conjunction with the first actual tutorial, lesson, instruction, you know, whatever you want to call it lesson seminar <laughs> take care guys and i'll see you next time